Welcome to the Determined People Podcast. We are committed to spreading encouragement, strength, and hope to a world in desperate need of it. Everywhere you look in today's culture, you see stories of remarkable people experiencing remarkable success. Our show focuses on the backstories of everyday, relatable people who have achieved greatness in their lives. We focus on the story behind what we see in the world. Our hope is that you find yourself in these stories, that you say, if that person made it, so can I. And now, our host, John Harrell. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. If you would, do me a favor hit the subscribe button, and that way you'll get an update every time that we publish an episode. And we have wonderful guests on here. We're spreading encouragement, strength, and hope to a world in desperate need of it. Our guest today is someone you may have heard of. Sandra D. Robinson is an actress. She is an author, a speaker, and she also does charisma. She teaches charisma, okay? I mean, yes, we're going to talk about how do you teach charisma on camera and in, to increase your presence but uh, let's get started. She has a great story of what I, what I call going from riches to rags. We're going to hear part of that, but that's just a small part of it. We're going to talk about what she's doing now and how she is helping men and women find their true purpose, their true calling in their lives, and empowering them to take that to the next level, to, the, to find their magnificence. All right? So let's get going. Sandra, thank you for being here. Hey, great intro. Thank you. <laughs> you can use my favorite word, magnificence. Well, it's, yeah. it's on your website. I know. Right? It is. It for is. a reason. So let's talk about your early life. I mean, you were Miss Pennsylvania, USA. <laughs> you dug that up, did you? <laughs> but you, <laughs> yes, but, yes. But you have st- had stage fright. How does that happen? Terrifying. I was terrified to be in front of people. Um, honestly, I would look back sometimes and go, "How in the world did I pull that off?" But I remember wishing that I could be like one of those girls because that, to me, represented confidence. That re- represented acceptance. Hmm. And I didn't have either, <laughs> I felt. So I remember watching, you know, when everything was televised with Miss America and Miss USA. I remember watching that. And and when I had the opportunity, that was back when we used to get papers, right? Hmm. In the newspaper, it said, submit yourself to be considered as a, as a contestant. So I had a, sent in a photograph, and I had been modeling already. I mean, I started working in front of the camera when I was 11. Mm-hmm. And because somebody tapped me and said, I think you can do this. And so that was one thing is I didn't have to speak my own words. I didn't have to be me. And that was actually what ended up drawing me further into that industry. But for the beauty pageant thing, I did sit back and wonder, like, how did I pull that off? And you know what? I actually think that after all those years of watching the Miss Americas, the Miss USAs, I studied the ones that were doing well. I studied the winners. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm going to get up there, and I don't recommend this. This is like the, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. But I basically got up there and acted like I was a pageant winner. Mm-hmm. That was all I knew how to do. And and it worked. I mean, it did get me to Miss USA, but this is the thing. Those kind of fake it till you make it will only get you so far. That's right. So I got to Miss USA, and I fell apart there because I was the youngest one by far. I had much little, like much much less life experience than all the other girls, and that that fake confidence couldn't hold up, honestly. So I I didn't do so well when I got there, but it was a wonderful experience, you know. So I'm grateful for it. So when you were on stage, what I'm hearing is that you felt like you were a fake. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, okay. I was. Okay. But I I was rewarded at the state level, and I did several. I did I, I would say three or four pageants and I did them all within two years so I jumped in and jumped out Mm -hmm. and I did well in all of them um you know except for when I went to the nationals but I made it to the nationals and that was something that a lot of girls don't get to experience so I was really you know kind of happy about that so yeah yeah What, what moved you into acting that same thing that I just said it was safer to be somebody else rather than to be me so when I was at home I got a lot of daily reminders that life had been better if I hadn't been born, Mm. that there'd be so much more money if it wasn't for me. And this came from one of my parents. My other parents um, was wonderful, but he wasn't around a lot because he was working. Mm -hmm. And when I say wonderful, he did the best that he could. He came, my father came from a very abusive childhood as well, but he had his own journey and, um, you know, family. And he was really a loving guy. He, he loved to spend the spare time that he had with his kiddos. And my, my siblings are much older than me. But they tell stories, too, of how whenever he did have spare time, he would always create something. So there were, there were, there was quality time with my dad. Mm-hmm. And we felt that, yes, he loved us. He cared for us. He was clumsy about certain things because he didn't know how to do a lot of those things. <laughs> but I had that. 
but the the parent that I was with the most, the feed into my brain was much different. And so when I discovered that there was this thing called acting, it came about in school, which is why I think it's so important that we keep the creative arts in schools. Mm -hmm. It bothers me so much that they're talking about that so many schools are getting rid of these programs. And I think it's really important. I discovered that it, that was kind of a safe place for me. You used the word before we started this, uh, talking about yourself having a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. That was a coping mechanism. I could escape and become someone else and then actually get accolades for it. I, that's what I saw as acceptance. So mm -hmm. it becomes sort of addicting after a while. And I don't think I'm the only one in, in the artist community that feels that way. So a lot of times I work with artists, in fact, over the years, and they'll put their portfolio forward and go, this is me, look at this, because they don't know that what is behind a portfolio actually has all the talent and the love and the magnificence that should be shared. You know, so often <clears throat> the greatest performances and the greatest music written, the best poetry, comes from the tortured side of our soul. Yes. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's a fuel to bring something good to life. Yes. So it can be used for good, but you must have really been really hurtful as a little girl to hear this from your mother. Uh, you know, I didn't realize how hurtful it was until I was much older, much mm -hmm. further along in my journey. Because when you're a kid, and this is something I heard just recently, no matter how abused there is, and I heard this from somebody that worked for um, Child Protective Services, actually, no matter how horrible the child's mm -hmm. parents are, when given the opportunity, the child will always go, most of the time, will go back to the parents. If they're given a choice of being with someone where they feel where they actually are safe, or going back to the parent, they go there. A child loves their parent no matter how horrible that experience has been. You're right, because you know we our mutual friend Stacy Johnson, yes. who runs Central Texas Table of Grace. We yeah. she and I've had deep deep discussions about this. No matter how bad the situation is, kids want to be because our family is part of our identity, right? Yes. It's the first foundation of our identity, and yeah. if you have a for fucked good, up family, you, yeah. If you have a yeah. fucked up family, <laughs> then it can lead to a you know potentially fucked up identity until you yeah. take the steps to correct that. And we're going to get farther into that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your acting career. You had a great success. I did. You yeah. a long and, resume. And you know, it's, it's so it's such a critical environment. Mm -hmm. The the world of acting and film and writing and directing all it's just so like music. I'm sure it's very very. So I'm looking at all these musical instruments in front of me here at the studio. Uh, but it's they're very it's very difficult to be in that atmosphere because there's a lot of rejection. Mm -hmm. And um, what what I found was interesting is I went into that because I was already experiencing rejection, mm -hmm. so it was comfortable. You oh, know what I'm saying? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. So that was it, it seemed like an easy thing for me to do. And I think you asked me a question that I didn't quite answer. So that I. That answer what you asked? Yeah, yeah, you did. No, I thought yeah. I sidetracked myself. That happens. Squirrel. There we go. <laughs> well, we'll I, be back. Your, 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 your interviewer has the attention span of a gnat, so <laughs> it's going to be the longest <laughs> podcast in history. <laughs> Joe Rogan's got nothing on, on me. So. <laughs> but no, but, but I remember one of the first times I think I saw you on television was when Two and a Half Men, one of my favorite shows. Oh, gosh. Br brilliant, yeah. brilliant yeah, comedy. Guest star, you yeah. played Georgia, the girl who was. the character. The girl who was coming to have the three-way with Nerdy Allen and his girlfriend he's yes. just broken up with. And yeah. I watched, because uh, I went back and watched it in preparing for this, and I watched your facial expressions just change. I go, you know, a lot of times acting is just a facial expression. And you went from, hi, Allen, I'm Georgie, you know, to just glaring at it. <laughs> and it was subtle, but it was, but it was brilliant. How did, I mean, so I've got a question now. You, you still had stage fright, but you had to go in an audition yeah. How did you overcome stage fright in you know, auditioning? You know, when I help actors with the audition process, I actually put them in this cave. <laughs> I walked into the audition in the character. Mm. So most of the time, I didn't have that sense of being so vulnerable and exposed walking in as me. Mm -hmm. I walked in as the character. Now, obviously, if the character is having a you know an emotional scene, and that's why I don't walk in like completely crying and hysterical, but I walk in as that character about to have an emotional experience, and that kept me emotionally safe in my mind sure. from doing that. Yeah, from from getting into that you know scary space because I, it did get a little strange for me if they had me there and they started to talk to me about my life, and sometimes they did that, and. Um, then I just had to like kind of hold my breath and get through it and answer the questions, and then I'd walk out. Usually, second guessing myself the whole way home. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's what I would do. So moving moving on here, but you were doing really really well. Yeah. And then you hit kind of a rough spot. 
I call it your riches to rags story. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. about that? Well, it was funny. I, I grew up in a blue collar home, so I wouldn't exactly call that riches, right? And then, yeah, so the success was great. The financial success was, people say, do you miss it? So there were certain shows that I made a lot of money, so yes. Mm -hmm. When you're on a show consistently, it, you work your, I work my, work my butt off for sure. Um, but um, I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, you know, when I was growing up and I was getting all that negative stuff said to me, I didn't know any better. And so I always wanted to be an actress. And, and so when I got the opportunity, I was working 18, 20 hour days, five days a week. But that was normal, right? That was all I knew. Mm -hmm. And then we would have people come in that were like from film and they would go, this is the worst schedule ever. You know, <laughs> we're, we're doing like, I don't know, I think every day on average, I would have 38 pages of dialogue when I was working in the daytime shows. So 38 pages of dialogue that I have to memorize and do. And when you're working in film, you're doing like four pages. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like it's a lot different, but it was it was all I knew. And uh, at one point, I, I think you know I, I would go from show to show to show. And honestly, looking back, I think what happened was I was moving from auditioning for a certain type mm -hmm. because of my age. They were pushing me into a different type, and so realized that you know their perception of a thirty-year-old is very twisted. <laughs> you know, a 40-year-old, they're, they're asking 30-year-olds to play 40-year-olds. That was normal. And so in my mind, I had not emotionally matured enough to understand how to even portray a mother. Mm -hmm. Remember what my experience with my mother was. Yes. So I'm not blaming my mother for, for the loss of everything. I'm just saying that I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to play a young mom, and I, I had nothing, really nothing to pull on to that. Because I picture they want a mom to be like a TV mom, a loving mom. Mm -hmm. I didn't experience that. I didn't know how to show that because I didn't ever see it mm -hmm. personally. I saw some of my friends' parents be like that. So I started to get into this period of self-doubt. And I think for a lot of people, whatever it is that you're doing, whatever you're called to, especially I think for an artist, there's moments or periods of self-doubt. And that's where the learning happens. And I think, you know, when I didn't work for several months, I just let myself fall into that. It's a slippery slope, that depression and mm -hmm. that, that self-abuse that goes on in the mind. And I definitely did that. And I started to really not be able to book things because I walked in with that energy, mm -hmm. which, as you mentioned, charisma was one of my favorite words, but certainly not charismatic to yeah. walk in feeling desperate. And, you know, the second that you walk into an audition, a job interview, or anything with that sense of desperation, even a sales call, it's going to do just the opposite. It's going to repel anything from you. And that was kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. So it was a year later, and I know you wanted to hear this, they went from around $500,000 one year to $5,745. And I know that because I found recently when we moved, not recently, but a few years ago when we moved, we found all these old papers, and there was my my statement for my taxes. And yeah, I did not handle that well. So I never actually slept in my car, but I slept on friends' sofas. I got rid of almost all of my belongings. A few things were left in, in storage, and got rid of a couple of my cars. So I was down to one, and was afraid that was going to be, mm -hmm. you know, taken away. And um, yeah, it was pretty awful. But throughout all of that, I was cared for. God provided for me. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I think back, and I, I have a friend of a friend say, well, I have a back room you can have. Well, it was a very dirty house. I'll just leave it at that. Very dirty. Very smelly. Um, he was a lovely man, lovely heart, lovely heart, mm -hmm. but wouldn't want anybody to come in and clean his house, and he didn't clean it for years. But it was a roof over my head, and it was in a, a beautiful area. So I still had comfort or the feeling of being comfortable, you know, so I was taken care of. And it was during this process that I was introduced to, to my faith, actually, which was kind of funny, because I think there was this discussion yesterday with somebody, go, you know, people say, oh, you should give us your testimony of how you came, you know, how you were born again, how you came to the Lord, and they're just expecting this beautiful, you know, tale, and I actually had a pastor say, would you like to accept Jesus as your Savior? And I looked at him again, what the hell, nothing else is happening. And that's what I'm <laughs> Nothing else is what I said. Like, that is not the beautiful story of like being on my knees, having the moon shine through on my face, feeling so connected. Like, yeah, no, it was what the hell. 
Let's try that. I said that to the pastor's face, yes. And then I woke up the next day going, yes, yeah, still stink. I'm still in the same spot on the same smelly, you know, floor with an air mattress and still hair. But that actually did start, things started to shift and change. And, <laughs> and, um, and I, within the next year, I was making six figures again. Really? Yeah. Well, you gave that pastor a great story to tell, and I'm sure I'm sure he he has <laughs> since, since that time. I think he just rolls his rolls his eyes every time anybody would think of me. <laughs> <laughs> but do you do you feel like that maybe at that time in your life, do you feel like God was maybe trying to humble you a little bit? Oh my gosh, possibly. Yeah, possibly. I mean, you said I, you had three cars. I mean, nobody needs three cars if they're just if it's just them. I but, need three cars. Well, you, you know, move. there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. No, that's not necessary for one girl to have three cars. No, it's not. It's mm-hmm. absolutely not. I grew up with cars. I love cars. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was a bit excessive, perhaps. So I think yes, I think it was a time of refocusing mm-hmm. and putting my eyes on on him. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't understand up until that point that he was carrying me through all that. I didn't understand that he put me in those positions. I was grateful to the people that I met that gave mm-hmm. me the opportunities. I mean, I was still back in Pittsburgh and I just graduated high school and I met a gentleman that was a talent manager from New York City. And I stayed with him until the end. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, when I moved away and came to Austin and finally said, okay, I'm done with acting, mm-hmm. he was still representing me. Really? Yeah. yeah. So he was like my, my second dad. You mm-hmm. know, and I met him in Pittsburgh, and he said, well, we got something, kid. And, you know, I'm driving him to the airport, and he goes, can you come up to, you know, can you make it up to New York? And I'm like, oh, I guess. I had a little bit of money from modeling, and there were these super cheap flights at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, basically a taxi that went from the two cities. And I'd get up there, and I would sleep in his office on the on the leather sofa in there with a pillow, and then I'd have to get up and get myself clean up and hide my suitcases before he came in and his clients came in for the day. <laughs> but he gave me a place so I could do that and I'd you know, pay my taxi fees, you know, when I was up there. And I had five screen tests in four months and that was actually the start of my, that was my work on my first job. Wow. But yeah. that was because one person believed in me. Mm-hmm. God put that one person in my path. And so one person. So there's two, there's two things I think I had to learn. It's the value of people. Mm-hmm. And the understanding that God puts those people there. Yes. So you can pray all you want, you mm-hmm. can dream all you want, but it comes through people. It does. So relationships and connection are really the foundation of everything that I that I teach to this day. And you t- you teach connection mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get to that in ju- in just mm-hmm. a minute. So as you started rebuilding your life, what was changed about you? Oh, well, I guess I had a different focus. You know. Um, Knowing that I wasn't, and this is a good thing, knowing that I wasn't worthy of things flowing to me and being great, more grateful when they did. Mm-hmm. Understanding I didn't need all those things that I thought were so important. That I didn't need to have, you know, it, the, the common phrase, I guess, is keeping up with the Joneses, right? I didn't yeah. need to have the, the thing that was in vogue. I, I really didn't. I needed to have something that fit me. And it's fine to like quality things. But sure. I think to this day, like, I love quality things. I'm also really, really good at finding ways to get them without paying full price all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at that. Yes. It's like, it's kind of my game. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, if I can, we can, like, we're just talking about my husband on the way in here. And I don't know why, I guess I saw a truck that reminded us of our, of our truck. And our truck is, I drove it up to Dallas. We were talking about going back and forth to the mm-hmm. city. We ran several hours in a car. And I said, can I take your truck this time? And, I mean, that thing was so much my back and my booty the whole way up there. <laughs> I was like, no wonder he wants to drive across country in this thing. It was incredible, right? And I asked myself, how much did we pay for that thing? I forgot that you bought it essentially new, but it was sitting on the lot for a while. So it was a year, mm-hmm. a year past. You know what yes, I mean? Yes, I do. And, and he told me what we paid for it, which is still a substantial amount. But I was like, dang, we did a good deal. That's good. <laughs> like, that's what I mean. Like, it's fine to have, you know, nice things, appreciate nice, well made things. Just don't have to. Go crazy, and I did when I was younger. I went crazy and overspent on stuff just to have it. Yeah, well, we've all done that. You know, yeah. I've done that myself. Sure, Everybody. but you, humility teaches you that that, and contentment as well. It brings contentment, and 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 te- teaching people how to not pay full price. That's a whole nother <laughs> teaching whole course show. you can do, it's right? Whole, whole other podcast. <laughs> correct, correct. So let's move into into what you're doing now. Um, how do you teach people 
to have charisma on camera. First of all, I, my experience has, has seen that a lot of people are shy on camera. They focus on it and they they just it becomes their focus and they just, their voice goes up into their throat and oh, yeah. and all. So how do you teach people yeah. to relax and have presence, the, whether on camera or not? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, <clears throat> you like my books, there's powerful presence on camera and off. And, and even now, you know, I've transitioned. I have another aspect of what I do at the company that I started in 2019. And we, we do nature-based training. And it's essentially the same thing. It's helping people to feel comfortable in their own skin. Mm-hmm. And that was what I wasn't, if you remember. Even once I started to have success as an actress, I had a following. I literally had a fan club or two. You know, I mean, I, I would go places and they would bring me into events along with other cast members a lot mm-hmm. of times to raise money for children's charities and things like that. Of course, I want to do those things. I had my own things that were important to me that I wanted to raise attention for. And interestingly enough, that's when I found my voice even just a little bit. Mm-hmm. When it was close to my line, mm-hmm. when it was something that was important to me, mm-hmm. I found the courage to speak up more. Still wasn't comfortable, but I was able to say, yes, I'll take that microphone. Whereas if I'm in a charity event with a lot of other people that I was very happy were extroverted and were taking the microphone and doing wonderful things on stage. And I remember once we had a cast member who was very gregarious, and he turned around and goes, Sandy, why don't you think something? And he hands me the microphone, and I'm standing there. I literally blanked out. <laughs> so when I oh talk about not being powerful in my presence, I was not. Like, I was one of the world. I don't think I've had, maybe I had one client, and we're still friends to this day, that came close to being as terrified as I was. But really, yes, there's all different levels of fear, and I think I've traveled through them all. Just going <laughs> but definitely, when you talk about stage fright and fear of, of being in front of people, it roots back to one of the five five major fears that we have in life. And, and the, your thoughts will actually create that biological reaction where you said your throat gets tight, your voice gets really high, and then it just, your, your mind hears that. That sounds foreign. Why does my voice sound like that? And then more anxiety, and then you stop breathing. And when you stop breathing, you get lightheaded. You start to get shaky. Like all of this stuff just feeds into itself and becomes this horrible situation that I knew all too well. Mm-hmm. And so the first thing that I did when I started working with people on camera, I was teaching TV hosts. That's under somebody else's shingle. It wasn't my, mm-hmm. my business. But she was a coach of mine when I was trying to get over my stuff. And I would have people come in, and I would just say, okay, we're going to put the script down. Just tell me about you. Tell me what, you know, what life you have to your kids. Would you like to do some fun? And I would wait until I saw them viscerally change. So their face would start to flush, and their lips actually get a little fuller, their pupils dilate a little bit. It's what happens when you look at somebody that you love. The same thing happens. So when I would see that, that's when I go, okay, and then I would have them tell me a story, and then the energy would get in their voice, and I'd be like, okay, this sound, this energy, this look is what I want to see. So I try to keep them. I said, well, how do you feel right now? I feel great. Yeah, okay, well, let's. And I would try to get them into that state while they're saying the words that they needed to say on camera mm-hmm. or on stage. And it sounds kind of like crazy to say that, but when I put somebody in a state where they feel like themselves, and I, when I started you know, working on my own shingle and helping people become speakers that had never spoken before, and some of them were doing keynote speeches in front of thousands of people, and they had never heard their voice in a microphone before. You know, how are they going to do this? Mm-hmm. And they, that does happen. If somebody is working for a company and they're, they've done extremely well, that company will say, hey, we're going to put you up on stage at the conference. And I've had these people call me up to train mm. Like, I, I, I can't, I can't do this. I say, first of all, we're going to take a word out of that sentence. The word not. And I'll say it again. I can't, but I can't do this. Like, they're already programming themselves that they can't even say that they can. And so, can't, that can't, the word can't is the worst four letter word in the English language. It's the word not. Yes, and it takes a bunch of different words. You mm-hmm. can get them out of your vocabulary, you're that much better. Sure. It takes a great awareness and a great amount of dedication to take that word out of your mm-hmm. language. Of course, you have to use it at certain times, but uh, avoiding it at all costs, whenever you can, usually it's, it's funny how much more charismatic a speaker can be when they avoid those things. Mm-hmm. It's really, those words, it's really interesting. So, um, so that's the, that's the first thing that I would say to them is like, okay, how are you most comfortable? Like, say they've been incredible in sales, and this is a perfect example of a specific person. I'm not going to mention her name, but she had been incredible at sales in this particular company, and they said, you've done so mm-hmm. well, you jumped so many levels, we want you to speak, and she almost quit. She was that terrified. And I said, what do you, how do you sell? Like, what's your technique? You know, and I got her on that. Instead of thinking about being in front of people, well, a lot of people have this idea, John, that they have to be like you. You're so comfortable on stage. You know how to, you know, 
raise your voice and be very, you can tell stories and you're very comfortable, they think you have to be like that. And they just have to be themselves. Yeah. That's how they got that far. Yeah. That's what people want to see. Mm-hmm. And so I have to remind them that that's what they need to do. So this woman said, well, I really just do well one-on-one. And I go, how do you do that? She asked a lot of questions. I'm like, okay. So you're going to get up on stage, and the first thing you're going to do is ask questions. She said, oh, I can do that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you're going to ask specific people questions. You're not going to ask, like, the mass of people. She goes, oh, okay. I said, no, you're going to ask specific individuals. And the second that I gave her the permission to do that, she relaxed in her body, and she's like, okay. Mm-hmm. And I gave her some bullet points, and I gave her some things, but mm-hmm. I didn't make it seem like she had to be less brown or, you know, JFK. <laughs> <laughs> this wonderful, super, you know, gregarious person up on stage, if that's not who she is. The audience wants to know in her circumstance, what is it about her that allowed her to get to this level? And if they can see themselves in her, that's what they want to see. And it's the same even if you're speaking, selling your own goods or selling – you know, your programs on stage or whatever it is, if you're a motivational speaker, they want to see who you are. Yeah. They want to see that. And so I just give people permission to do that. And with the work that I'm doing now, it's just really about being themselves and being in the moment, which is another whole challenge for people right now with our technologically driven lives. Yeah. yeah. In, our, in our look at me culture. Yeah. But you know what she says is so true. I mean, people think they need to be the next Les Brown or JFK. It's like, no. They are good because they are comfortable with who they are, and it comes across, right? Yeah. But, you know, what you're what you're talking about, everything that you've done in your life has prepared you to be able to look at somebody and see that visceral response in them because acting really is listening, being yeah. a good listener. It's true. And that's what it is. Acting actually set me up for what I'm doing now enormously. Yes. Yes, it's true. Yes. Because you learn to read the nuances as an actor. You search for those things. Mm-hmm. Body language is important. And it's not just learning how to do it yourself as an actor. It's reading from the other person. Mm. So you're right. Yeah. Listening. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, the number one fear that people have, number one fear is public speaking. That's yeah. people's number one Sometimes fear. Sometimes over death. Uh, yes. but, yeah, number, <laughs> number two is death. I'm like, you can if you muddle through a, the worst public talk on the planet, you're still alive. Yeah. Death is kind of final, right? I'm, right? I mean, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just not ready for it, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so true. What's it like for you as the teacher and the coach when you see somebody make a breakthrough? Oh, anybody can tell you this. It's fantastic. Mm. You know, when you see that little thing go, for me, it's I'm helping people remember who they are. Mm-hmm. So I'm not giving them, I'm going to give them some skills and some stuff. Yeah, I hope you look good on camera. You know how to frame yourself. You know how to look, walk across the stage and stay. There's techniques and things mm-hmm. that, that I'm master certified in, and I can give that to you. But really, it's the moment that they realize they can just be themselves. It's almost like this validation of, oh, it's this complete release of, I can do that. I don't have to do what I thought. I don't have to be who I thought I had to be, mm-hmm. right? That their identity is actually perfect as they are. They don't have to be somebody else. Mm-hmm. So when I see that, I think that's when I go, all right, now she's on the way. He's on the way. You, know? you got a lot of, a lot of skill set that, that – or I would say unique is the word that comes to mind, but they're just remarkable because actors can get pigeonholed into we think you're the person we see on screen, right? Yeah. When they're really just could be completely different off screen. Yes. I've met a few of them. Sure. <laughs> we, we all have. Yep. But you know, I want to read something that's on your website. It's an original quote of yours, and I love this quote. When you own the magnificence that is inside of you, the world will act accordingly. Yeah. To me, it says you're taking ownership of who you are. Yeah. And you're also setting healthy boundaries for anything that doesn't enrich or edify your life, stay out. That's so good. Yes. Yes. And the work that we're doing now with the nature-based training, it involves horses. So mm-hmm. we, we, pair, we pair leaders and professionals with horses. We do not ride. And the first thing I get from people a lot of times, it's funny. It's like, well, if you don't ride horses, what do you do with them? I'm like, aha, and there's your first transformational thought. Um, there's kind of other things nature can teach you other than what you perceive as being the only way, right? And that serves <coughs> with themselves, too. Like, the only way they see themselves is probably so much more. If they're looking at a horse thinking you can only do one thing with this horse, they're probably missing out on a heck of a lot that they're able sure. to do. So when we when we talk about the um, the, the nature-based nature-based training, we, we pair them with horses. It's so interesting to see the boundaries is one of the things that comes up a lot. 
And this way is actually reinforced not by a human where a, a, another human can butt up and go, you know, start to defending or deflecting mm-hmm. what's coming their way. The feedback is coming from a horse that doesn't speak an animal that's a sentient being, has its own thoughts, has its own read of your energy and your movement and your intentions, and doesn't speak your language. Mm-hmm. So the reaction is 1,200-pound movement, usually away from you. Yes. Or if you're not holding up your boundaries, maybe there's too much in your space. And, you know, so they'll say, mm-hmm. huh, well, what could you do to, and people don't realize how easy it is to ask the animal to move away. Like, they don't realize how easy it is sometimes to keep somebody from getting into their inner circle that really might not be the best um, influence sure. yeah. for them. You know, it's simply sometimes just saying no. For the horse, it's putting up a hand. And when I show them, when I show people that, they go, that's it? I go, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it. You know? And I had, can I share a quick story about that? Absolutely. You, boundaries. you were talking a lot, we're talking a lot about acting, and I was terrified of people. I did not grow up in a family that had uh, touchy feely at all, at all. Mm-hmm. And so when I got into television, you said some people can't separate the character from real life. Well, I love soap opera fans, but there's definitely that. And it's because we were in their living room every single day, right? I'm showing up in their house every single day. So there's this sense that they can walk up and hug me. Mm. And that scared the bees. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't want to run in the other direction. Like, where are you going to go? And, and I would, you know, find ways. And I felt terrible because I felt like that was kind of a, you know, kind of a bitchy thing to do, to run away when I, I wanted to be cordial and kind, but I was terrified. And it also helped me have empathy for people that do run away from other people. I thought, oh, okay, it's not necessarily that they're being rude. It's that they're probably scared to death of something. And I was. So I had one woman that I worked with. Dee Evans, and to this day I love her, and we still communicate via Facebook or social media, whatever we see mm-hmm. her. And, and it's funny, she goes, I would tell her, like, I'm so terrified to go outside because they're going to hug me. And she goes, oh, sweetie. She said, just do this. Hi. And she puts her hand out to shake somebody's hand. I'm like, oh, my gosh. That's the simplest, most stupid thing that I overlooked. Of course, nobody was going to hug you mm-hmm. if you put your hand out like this and say, this is what I prefer. And you're being friendly, but I'm keeping them there at my arm's length. <laughs> it was so funny. It was one of those things like that was the most obvious thing, and I couldn't see it. Right? <laughs> and so, so I credit her for saving my, my young life. <laughs> <laughs> and allowing me to meet more fans and not feel like I was being so horrible to them. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know with fans also because, you know, all people, people that are fans, people that are just acquaintances, whatever, most people have an agenda for what they want from your life, right? Yeah. And so you just have to – we all – I'm not saying just live in a, a cocoon, but we all have to sort of have boundaries with people and make sure that, that they really do, if they want to get to know me, that they really do have my best interest at heart, and then I'm wide open with them, right? I'm, I'm happy to connect with, with them. Let's go back to horses. Horses are the most beautiful, majestic animals. And they also sense if someone's afraid of the horse, the horse can tell. And if somebody's comfortable with the horse, the horse can tell. But they are just, oh my gosh, such beautiful animals. I've had three horses. They, they were race horses, but yeah. those horses were athletes. And they knew they were athletes. They carried themselves differently. And yeah. it, was, it, was, it was cool to watch. As human athletes do. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so. And it's true what you say. They, they do, when you say those <clears> sense of the fear... It's not so much that they're sensing fear and reacting to it, like they're going to be aggressive back, but they are reading your energy. The most important thing to a horse is they feel safe. Mm-hmm. And so this correlates a lot with the corporate groups that I bring in because we're talking about creating a safe emotional environment in workspaces. Mm-hmm. So something as simple as when somebody makes a mistake, how is that handled? Because if there is an emotional safety, people are going to not admit the mistake. They're going to blame somebody else. They're going to hide the mistake. Mm-hmm. There, there's going to be things that are going to be happening because they're afraid of being shamed. That's, That's not right. a safe emotional environment. And so we correlate that when people are working with the horse. And the horse really is just giant prey animal. Their focus is looking at you as a new person in their inner space. Mm-hmm. Are you safe? Am I safe with you? Mm-hmm. So the second that somebody is fearful, they go, uh... I think I gotta take charge here. I gotta leave here. Mm-hmm. You know? So, a lot of times when horses run away with people, it's because the person on the back is scared. 
and he doesn't know what to do. So the horse goes, don't worry, I got it. I'll get it back again. <laughs> and takes off. You know, and so, and, and that's true. And I'm not saying that that's safe, you know, that's safe in any way, but that's what they're looking for. They're looking, am I safe? And so if somebody is overly aggressive or they're un, they're not cohesive, mm-hmm. you know, they're not coherent, as you say, um, meaning that they're trying to be comfortable on the outside, kind of like me when I was younger, mm-hmm. trying to be comfortable on the outside and pretend to be a certain thing but not really feeling it on the inside, mm-hmm. horses sense that. And they won't really participate with you the way you would like. And that's when we can do a little inner check, kind of bring us back to the present moment, settle and find that peace within. Mm-hmm. And when we're in that state, then nature responds. And that horse will walk back up to you. But there's a natural rhythm for everything. And we are so out of that with the way we are living. And just coming here, I don't know, I have to look up this, this statistic. I'm going to say right now, I don't know that it's accurate, but somebody uh, that was a host on the radio quoted that she had just read that children now spend a total of an average of 15 minutes a day outside. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, John, but when you were little, did you spend only 15 minutes outside? As much time as I could, I would spend outside. Right. Yes, yeah. So 15 <clears throat> minutes outside is terrifying. The fact that we actually have something, Richard Lou wrote about this in his book, Nature Deprivation, um, it's, it's literally called Nature, Nature Depri- Deprivation Disorder. Say that three times fast. <laughs> and he wrote a book on this called Last Child in the Woods. It is now actually been officially put into our, our books as a official psychological disorder. All you need to do is get out into nature. And it's really sad to me that somebody can only have their child outside for 15 minutes. A day. That's waiting for the bus. Right? Yeah, yeah. And walking in yes. that's about it. That's about it, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's where we get into that. We are part of nature. We are made with creation. And so we share that same rhythm mm-hmm. there. When people, when, you, when you're really stressed out, what kind of vacation do you like to go on, John? Beach. 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 Yeah. Why? Because it's the only way I can truly relax. Something about the waves, it's just I get in synchronicity with them and in sync with them, whatever the way. And it's like I can all of a sudden, it takes a few days. But I can all of a sudden just kind of let go and realize that I'm really relaxed in a way that I don't feel yes. most of the time, right? And that, what you just said, is exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And the, the more further, the further away we get from that natural rhythm, that connection to nature, the longer it takes. And I know what you mean about taking three days, sometimes four days, and then you say, well, so I feel like myself now. And usually in America, we take very short vacations, so we're usually mm-hmm. on our way back. Yeah, now it's time and, to go home. Yeah, right. Yeah. exactly. And then you're right back into it, and then that, that sense of <clears> feeling <throat> like yourself and feeling great. So that's the response that I get when I have people that come to the retreats for a day. Mm-hmm. I have, and it's been wonderful for me to actually put people on camera at the end of the day, and for the first time, they're not afraid to do it. They actually get on them, and so often they'll say, I found myself. I feel like myself. I, I was able to, mm-hmm. you know, I, I believed all this stuff. I remember who I am. But they literally have said this at the end of the day. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm just helping people remember who they are. And you can do that yourself by at least spending one to 15 minutes a day yes. outside in nature. You know, drive with your windows down when it's beautiful. Let the breeze hit your face. It's not, it's not something you really have to go to the beach or spend thousands of dollars. To, to go on a vacation to experience. True. Of course, in Texas, we want to wait till October, November to put the, put the windows <laughs> down. <laughs> but, but put the windows down, and then we sweat our, you know, we sweat out 10 pounds and put the windows down. If, if, if I could sweat all 10 pounds, I would put my <laughs> window down in July. But, you know, and, and, I, and there's a there's a testimonial videos on your website, which we're going to put on the on screen here. But one thing that someone said was, quote, you learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. You learn a lot about yourself. Let's go back to one thing real quick. Now, I, just, I do want to address this. Something that... Um, you said earlier about schools are eliminating the arts. Now, I will address that because when I was growing up, I grew up in a very abusive home, and I had no one to to be, you know, confide in and, and lean on, neither parent. And so, you know, I played football, but I also sang in the choir, and I acted in the school plays. Those things gave me the emotional release I needed that I wasn't able to get yeah. from parents. So That's eliminating those things is a huge huge mistake and now the e- schools are even eliminating recess you need to let elementary and middle school and high, you know, get out and just let work some energy off they yeah. need it because they get pent up yeah and all the stuff with phones and computers and games and everything else that they will do it just it changes the wiring of the brain but not in a good way not it in a good way the wiring of the brain. it literally changes it and 
I wish people could understand that. I mean, I geek out on that, right? Um, the certifications and studies that I've done are so involved around uh, uh, neurology and neurobiology and and I'm not saying that I'm a doctor by any means, but I'm fascinated. With but she played one on TV. I have. So <laughs> you really did. Yeah, yes. I'm a doctor. So I don't know what that was all about. I don't know what they saw in me. They're like, yeah, she'd be great to be a doctor. She's a doctor. Let's make that happen. I don't know. But I did for a while. I played a series of those. There was a series where like, I got killed a lot. You know? My sister goes, you die all the time. I go, but I guess I'm good at it. I don't know. I'm a good boy. I read somewhere, and I don't know this to be true, but that actors like to die on screen. It's like the ultimate uh, thing they can do, you know? <laughs> it's very rarely the Shakespearean, you know, experience. It's like, yeah, I was shot, I spun around, I landed in a cold, cold, cold pool of blood, you know, which was just like cake, cake, what is it, syrup, the sugar syrup? Mm-hmm. Cake, cake syrup? Um, Carol. Yeah, Carol. Yeah. 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 So Carol syrup, and, and it's like I'm lying on the cold cement floor in a studio freezing my butt off in a bikini. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> while, while the main character of the show, who was kind of a jerk in real life, actually, um, just blamed everybody else why he couldn't remember. He goes, you're in my eye line. You know, it's too loud in here. There's a fan going because he couldn't remember his lines. Uh. And I'm lying in this cold pool of water going, can you please just say the line? Like, literally one line. Mm-hmm. And it was there for 45 minutes laying on the floor. So it's not as glamorous. <laughs> so that's the it's not. I've been on. I've been on TV sets and movie sets. It's not as glamorous. It, no, it's it, not. It, what we what we see the end product is really cool, but it's it not. Is, it's yeah. not that. It, it takes a lot of talent. I mean, it's a it does. talent, right? It, it takes a lot of talent. It's, it's a collaborative it's effort. Easy. It's got to be a collaborative effort. Yeah. It's not just one person. So you have some trainings coming up. One's on October 29th. Yes. That's a one day awesome. event, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. And then you have a, a a a longer one coming up in summer of 2023. Yes. Tell us about those. What will those What will those entail? Well, what will the, pe- the, What can people expect? So a, a lot of times, we'll do groups will come and work. With do the nature based training with the horses. And so we'll have a company say, hey, they want to come with eight people, want to come with 20 people. And then we build that day around that particular company mm-hmm. or corporation and what they need and what they're looking for. But coming up on October 29th and then the one next summer, these are what I would call open enrollment. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to be part of a group and it's a fraction of, of the cost, at least when you come to the one in Austin. It's a great way to kind of put your foot in and taste this kind of a work and see what it's like. Mm-hmm. So um, October 29th, we start early in the day. And uh, we, we, we do a lot of bringing people into the present moment. We work with the horses interacting throughout the day. We also give people tools for mindfulness. And it's so funny. I have to be sometimes careful, careful where I use that word. Because people in certain frames of mind will go, oh, that's woo. And they disconnect it. Mindfulness literally means be aware of where your attention, where your mind is. Mm-hmm. So we have 100% attention all the time. Usually it's fragmented horribly. So working on mindfulness literally makes you aware of when you are not focusing. Where is your mind going? Where are your thoughts going? That's mindfulness. And so to be able to be in a crazy work day, a hectic work day, and have a tool that within a minute will have you reset from maybe a troublesome meeting or a phone call or something that's going on in your personal life and you have to be there and be present mm-hmm. to use this tool of mindfulness that we teach to be able to actually be in that moment and focus on what you need to do. It's not impossible. We're in control of those thoughts. And like I said, we talked about stage fright. The thoughts that you think can actually create that physical dis, dis, mm-hmm. dis-ease, mm-hmm. right? That, that, that physical reaction. And it will lead to dis-ease if you don't actually get a hold of it. And so we, we teach people how to deal with that overwhelm by working with the horses and getting into that state of mind of being in the present. And it's a ton of fun. I mean, in the end, it's a lot of fun. So we do some teamwork and stuff with the horses. And, and we work with the horses as a partner, not mm-hmm. as a tool. Mm-hmm. It's really important for me to say that. So at the end of the day, yeah, I promise there's going to be transformation. And I can't say exactly what's going to happen between you and the horse partner, but it will be brutally honest, because they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People, people accept that feedback a lot easier from from a horse than they do from a person. And everybody's experience is going to be unique to them and, yes. and what they get out of it. But, yeah. you know, what you're talking about being the mindfulness says that that creates more greater presence. Presence yeah. is a gift. If you But you anybody can create it, but they've got to be willing to do it and be focused. Some of the most present people I've ever met are ones that just focus like you're the only person in the world right at this moment. Yeah. And that moment may last three seconds, but that's it. You're, so how does you're, that make you feel? Makes what you feel mean? important. Accepted, yes. Seen. Like, like I am important. Yeah, because everybody we know, everybody wants to be seen and heard. Some people don't feel like they have a voice, so we we have to be that voice for them until they find their own. Yep. Yeah. You know, one that's of the, what, that's what coaching. One of, yes, and one other thing I want to I want to address is, and you you use the word 
and teach, teach empowerment. It's all across your website, empowerment. But when you talked about earlier about, about if you set up a, an atmosphere of fear, you're not empowering people. If you empower your employees, mm -hmm. your coworkers, your colleagues, that they can make a mistake and you expect that because we're human, yeah. but you're not going to hold it against them. Right. The right person who feels empowered will not make that same mistake twice. In fact, what you've done is you've built trust with them. You've built that safe environment you're talking about where they feel confident to go out and be themselves and show the magnificence that truly is inside of them, right? So true. And mm -hmm. I think it starts, too, with the leader themselves. So leaders yes, make yes. mistakes. Leaders make mistakes. And so, and this is a, I, I see even when we're doing the work with the horses. In fact, sometimes especially it's clear there mm -hmm. that if I have, a, a, you know, a, a leader on a team that comes in, being vulnerable is a really challenging thing for someone. Mm -hmm. And you have to be vulnerable if you say, hey, I made a mistake. And it's sometimes just going, wow, hey, look, guys, I want you to know I was really off on this one. <laughs> so let's just sit down and figure out how we can make this better. You give me some of your thoughts. And when you do something like that, it instantly, number one, makes the team want to support the leader more. Mm -hmm. To be able to say, oh, so they do make mistakes. So, And, of course, you were saying it makes them feel like it's a safer environment that if they mess up, they can come to the coworker, or even the, the leader, even the boss, and just go, hey, I think I made a mistake, or I'm not getting where I need to get, and I need some help. And know that the rest of the team will be there with that response to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. That is so wonderful when one of the number one things that companies are worried about right now is retention. Mm. Keeping talent. How do, I, how do I get talent? How do I keep talent? And literally, that conversation around mistakes and how to support each other is one of the main things that you can do to help people feel like they're in an environment where they're contributing, where they are emotionally safe, that they can come up with ideas, throw out new ideas that would be considered, that may be tossed out, but at least they can throw out new ideas. Sure. When you say, hey, we have an issue here, can somebody just throw out some of these and see what we come up with? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's the creative process yes, that we sir. want to try to encourage in the younger people and keep that going. We want that part of the brain to keep developing. So going back to where you expose your kiddos to, make sure that they have that opportunity to really celebrate that, that creative part of them. It doesn't mean they have to go and play piano. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be that they're, that they're creating in a different way, but that process and, and working as a team and having that together is amazing. And I see that when we put teams together and work with the horses. Mm. Because they're really dealing with a giant problem, <laughs> moving this animal that they don't know how to move. Right? Most of them are not horse people, right. and I don't tell them how to move. I will sometimes tell them how horses move each other, which is kind of like when you go to a different country, you learn some of the customs mm -hmm. so that you can fit in a little bit sure. and understand what's happening. So I'll give them <laughs> some of that information, uh, but they don't they don't know how to do any of that stuff, and we don't give them tools. For most of the work, we don't give them halters and lead ropes and all that kind of stuff. They have to kind of figure out how to connect with this individual mm -hmm. with four legs and get something done. And if they're working as a team, they have to look to each other and make that request to the animal in a way that is unified. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's it's a it's a very out of the box way of working on teamwork. <laughs> but it, but it, but it works because yep. what you're talking about is collaboration. And yep. when you're talking about the, the leader being vulnerable, just to say, I am human. I don't have all the answers, but together we can come up with all the answers we need. We can create together. That shows um, a willingness, but also all of us, all of us want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Yeah. And it feeds that need. Especially and if you, now. Don't you feel yes. now with the past, like from the pandemic, I think one of the things is people want to be involved in something meaningful. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and you talk about that on your website about finding the true callings of our heart, and you say that in, your, in the in the intro part of your book, impact yeah. is find the true calling. You, when our calling is not our career, it's not what we no, do. Not always. Sometimes it is. I mean, well, some of that. Maybe some maybe. of that, but yeah. I mean, we have to we have to work to make a to make a living, right? But other things, our calling could be, I don't know. Mine's involved with children. You know, yeah. anything that anything that involves struggling children, which all kids are struggling nowadays, then I'm going to be all over part of it, something that's involved with that. Right. So yeah. we're going to put a, we, uh, a link to your website up on screen. And one awesome. uh, last question, I, I, and I want to know, have you forgiven your mom? Yes. I've, I've forgiven her. 
I, and I come back to, and this is what helps me when forget we all need to learn to forgive and multiple. Sure. I mean, something that cuts you off in traffic to, you know, the abuser in your life. But forgiving, as everybody knows, is not for them; it's for you. Yes. And to be able to look at human beings and say they're doing the best they can with what they've been given. Now, my mother's brain was made a little differently. And it took me a while to realize I will never understand how she went through life. Um, less than five percent of the people on the planet have a brain like her. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness. <laughs> but she did the best that she could with what she had. Still, that's still true. And do I think that, or I wish that the outcome of her efforts would have been a little bit kinder? <laughs> yeah. Sure. But, I mean, I look too at, at other people and their circumstances and go, okay, they did the best they could with what they had at the time. And that helps a lot. That helps a lot. But, you know, um, I look at it like this. Although I didn't understand it at the time when I was growing up because I wanted to be in a different family, God wow. put me in that family. And now I've got a story to tell, which allows me to relate to kids who are much younger than me. And most of them are black or Mexican, and they don't look like me at all. But by, ha- by having that set of parents, even though you couldn't have the acceptance at that time, right. you've grown into the person you are now. I think the empathy, the understanding of how to have empathy, under, un- understanding how to identify what your feelings are, what your hurt is in a situation, and there's more than one. You know, literally write down this is these are the things. And then having one of those things that is the most important, you go, Yeah, that's that's really how I feel in this. Mm-hmm. And then writing down these are the needs that I feel that I have that haven't been met. And then just trying to figure out, you know, the other person that's involved in the situation. Well, what, what do you think they were feeling? Mm-hmm. What do you think their needs were? And sometimes they'll even come out to be the same when you really oh. stop and think about it. Interesting. And that gives you the idea or the the ability to empathize, and that allows you to forgive as mm-hmm. well. You know, and sometimes if it's a conflict that's ongoing, you may actually find a, a common ground by doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really pretty amazing. The old, uh, I think it's a Chinese proverb that said, "Seek first to understand before trying to be understood." Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's really that's really incredible because I've had those situations. In fact, I was actually offered three acting roles in my life. And that does not happen often. I realize how unusual that is. Um, unusual, A, that I was able to work as mm-hmm. often as I did and didn't take another job, you know, except for once during that time that I told you about. But uh, but I was also very fortunate that I had three different moments where I sat down in, in a casting director's or, or executive producer's office and they said, we'd love you to take this role. And I'm like, you want me to audition? No, we just want you to take this role. Mm. Two of those times was because I'd worked with the executive producer and had a co-worker that was very, very difficult. And they knew that I could handle that. Mm. And I looked back and I thought, oh, that is really weird, but what did I do? And, and I was able to to do that. And it's actually the same thing, the same way I look at people and I work, that I work with now, is I know that no matter what is going on on the outside, and I can do this with people that have run across my, my path, maybe in rudeness or whatever, because mm-hmm. people do that, right, when they're stressed. And I can look at them and go, okay, there's something inside of them that is beautiful. Maybe I can see what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I can see what's really true there as opposed to the anger or whatever is on the outside that is really not so lovely or lovable. There's something inside of there. And I've actually had some people that have ended up being some of my, my greatest, most impactful friends, whether they were in my life for a short period of time or a longer period of time. But I've had some moments like that with people that were so aggressive that nobody wanted to go near them, and they ended up being wonderful. Mm-hmm. And you probably had the same experience when sure. you were working with the kids and stuff. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And some adults. <laughs> and some adults. Yeah. Some adults can be really difficult to be uh, with. But, you know, what you're talking about is true connection. Look at the heart of the person. Don't just look at what we see on the outside. Because when you really connect with other people, you look beyond that, look at the heart of the person, who they are. And that's when you connect. Mm-hmm. That's when you connect. So... Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having you me. Wonderful, wonderful stories, and, and I'm really honored. I mean this. I'm really honored to know you. So. Aw, thank you. Likewise. So let's do this again and tell, talk about those other podcasts we were talking about. <laughs> we'll, make, we'll make it happen. All right. Thank you, Sandra. And that's our show for today. Thank you all for being here. And check out Sandra's website, sandradrobinson.com. It's on the screen there, but check it out. And if you feel like you're ready to step out of your comfort zone and move into greater confidence, greater presence. You're ready to grow. Growth is hard, 
But guess what? Nothing ever happens in the in, unless you get into the discomfort zone. That's where growth comes from. So check it out. You will not you will not be disappointed. I promise. I will be back tomorrow with another thirty second message of encouragement, strength, and hope. And find us on the audio podcast as well. Until then, everyone, be well.